Hello. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started. Uh, traffic was heavy like it always is, so we'll probably have some people filter in. Um, thank you guys for being here. Uh, we've had a really, really great year here at the board with uh, continuing education and non-continuing education and a lot of great programs. So we're super excited to see you today. A lot of you are familiar. I've seen you at some other events, so thank you for your support. Um, please keep paying attention to the emails that, that come out and, and supporting our events. We really, really appreciate it. Um, today's panel is going to be about negotiating multiple offers and doing all that within the framework of the realtor etiquette. So I'm really super excited. We handpicked these guys as people we thought that were exemplary of that. Um, they all have great backgrounds and have certainly dealt with all this, even across um, market changes and other things that have gone on. So I'm really super, super excited to have you guys today. I'm going to introduce everybody kind of quickly. If there's anything I miss, we can go back. Or if you want to interject something, um, that we can do that. We've only got an hour and a half. So I'm going to try to get through a couple of topics, and at the end, if we have some time, do some general questions. And then I think most of these guys are able to hang out just a little bit um, afterwards if you guys have specific questions you want to talk to them about. Um, and they're, they're not that hard to find. Um, also, we have a, a CE class coming up on September 5th. Is that correct? September 5th is Scott Pinella uh, building a team. So uh, keep your eyes out for an email there, or uh, all these events are always at abr.org. So I'm going to start on the left. Cheryl King is a partner at Morris Hardwick Schneider, uh, who is the closing attorney, just to be 100% clear, um, <laughs> if you didn't know that. Um, she has been there for almost 16 years. She's a, a member of the management committee. Uh, and she's the managing attorney at the Alpharetta office, which is off Preston Circle, correct, or Preston Ridge? OK. Um, so if you haven't been there, um, hopefully you'll get Cheryl as your attorney. Um, and, and full disclosure, Cheryl and I go way back to a past brokerage. And Mitch and I actually worked together for almost six years. So I guess it's only, it's only fair to put that out there. And, and when I said, yeah, they were handpicked by me. Uh, <laughs> And Mitch is the associate broker, team leader for the MOVE team, a small team with one buyer's agent and a team coordinator at REMAX Prestige in Johns Creek and Alpharetta. Um, it's his 29th year in the business. What is, what, what's the 30 year? Is that the crystal? The crystal crystal? It's the titanium platinum. That's right. And one of my favorite things here in his, his bio says, um, I've received all the awards you typically should get by starting young and getting old in the real estate business. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, Debbie Sunshine is a formal, former social worker uh, at Grady Hospital. In 1981, she left social work to join the Sandy Springs office of Colwell Banker. Uh, she was Rookie of the Year. Uh, and as a consistent top producer, she's been recognized by Colwell Banker in the top five for over 25 years and the number one agent in the company for Metro Atlanta for the last three years. Um, she also has the distinction of having the seventh most expensive listing in the United States. Not in Georgia, not in Fulton County, but in the United States. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, Jeremy Trask is 18 years in the business with seven of them uh, as the, is it team leader? Managing broker. Um, uh, since 2012, he's been growing a team uh, with a listing specialist, a buyer specialist, and a full-time client service manager, uh, client services manager, uh, VA as a marketing manager, and VA as the closing manager uh, at the Buckhead Keller Williams. Uh, we are part of the generosity generation and a strategic, strategic referral-based company covering most of the greater metro Atlanta. Uh, their goal is to hit 80 transactions this year, and they're on pace for 75. Um, and Diane Bryant is broker associate with Berkshire Hathaway uh, in the Buckhead office. She's been in. I'm not done. <laughs> that's right. I get to do that. That's that's the moderation segment of my, of my gig. Um, she's been in real estate for 11 years this month. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, 
She began her career receiving Rookie of the Year at the DeKalb Association. Uh, since coming to Berkshire Hathaway, she has achieved the President's Circle and Chairman's Circle Gold Awards, putting her in the top 2% of all realtors worldwide with Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Diane and I met, per se, we got to speak a minute at a panel she did last year, um, and she is definitely on our panel list. She does a great job of, of sticking to her guns on what she does. Um, a lot of people chase after all these crazy new things that you can get and all that. Um, and I think Diane just does a great job of saying, this is how I do it, it works for me, and you know, if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, fine, but you, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to chase after all the, all the shiny stuff. So we're going to get going. I'm going to do my best to let anybody that wants to answer uh, any of these questions a chance, but I don't, we're not just going to go down the line and go back and forth. Um, so if you guys do have something that you want to interject, feel free to jump in or raise your hand or wave the mic around or whatever. So um, go ahead and make sure your mics are all green, at least if you're going to um, be talking, I want to make sure we can hear you. Um, I think the first thing I want to cover is just talking about kind of an overview of multiple offers. This has been, um, I think, something probably that we all face now that is, is a little bit, it's a little bit crazy. It seems to ease maybe a little bit, but I don't think it's ever going to go away um, in the sense it may come back later in your career or whatnot. Um, Diane, why don't we start with you on this, just as far as how in general do you, let's start with listing side. If you're on the listing side, how do you handle when you get an offer and then you think you're getting another and somebody calls and says, hey, we're going to make an offer. How do you handle multiple offers in general? I, I have a great example of that, and thank you for asking me. And your profile of me was perfect. Thank you. And it hadn't changed, believe it or not. Um, I had 10 offers in two days on a townhome that actually we listed for $10,000 over market value and we sold it for $40,000 over market value. And I did it very simply. I did an estimate, estimate of net dis I told everybody that called me that I'm presenting all the offers on Sunday. We thank you for your offer. Would you go ahead and just give me your best and final? And I, got, I had 10 offers. I literally did an estimate of net to seller on every single one of them. I physically met with my seller and laid them out. Of course, you know sellers, all they wanted to see was the number, the net number. Okay. So we looked at the net number, and then when he, when he found the net number he loved, we looked at the details of the contract to make sure that we could live with that, and then we responded, and that's how I did it. I'm, I've only had that many offers on maybe five houses in the last three years. So it's not something I do every day. But sellers get confused. We do it every day, they don't. And so I just made it real simple with estimate of net to seller. Um, and it seems to work. Some One person, I just sent them to him in PDFs because he was a young guy that was very savvy and we talked on the phone. But the other, the other four I met with face to face. Excellent, thank you. Jeremy, you wanna? I'm going to just throw in something real quick. Just to, because I'm like a real simple person, um, if I have more than three offers, I do a spreadsheet, and I have, of course, the price, the closing costs, the earnest money, the financing. You know, I just have a column for everything because it's not just the price. And especially in a multiple offer situation, you know, all the prices are typically going to be pretty good. But we want to see what's the strongest contract. So to me, and I don't put names, I just I put A, B, C, D, because I think that that's important. Um, and then we also, depending on the situation and how many offers and what the deal is, um, and depending on the sellers, I think it's important when you narrow it down to sometimes personalize the offers. And obviously, we'll talk about that on the other side. But um, I've had two sellers recently that chose an offer because they met the buyer, which is completely unusual. During a showing? Or yeah, it just happened to, you know, somebody came home early or left late or whatever happened. But they, they met and they just identified with those people. And sometimes that can backfire totally, you know, but, a lot of times. But, um, but this happened to just be, you know, and then of course you have the people that send the picture of their kids and their dogs and all that stuff. And, you know, we do the love letters and everything. But, um, and, and I will include those, but that's just once you sort of narrow down. But that spreadsheet has been very helpful to me. And that way I don't get accused of, you know, favoring anybody because the seller has no idea who's who uh, when they, they're just looking at the columns and the numbers and then, then we narrow down. Do you have a net to seller on that as well? Or do you just have the terms? 
I, I probably don't do a net to seller for okay. all 10 offers. No, but I mean, it's pretty it clear, you know, right. I mean, it's not real hard to okay. take the closing costs off the cool. price or whatever. But you Do you know. want to elaborate for a second on, is it like financing type? I mean, just some of the factors. Yeah, I mean, obviously I have a column that'll say if it's a 95% loan or if it's a cash offer or, you know, what, what the different terms are because that's going to make a big difference. Right. If there's an appraisal contingency or not, hello, right. you know, I mean, that's super important. That's a lot more important than the price on a lot of these offers because what's happening, and we all know, is people are offering all kind of prices hoping that it won't appraise. Right. So, right. you know, yeah, I'll give you $100,000 more. It's not going to appraise, but the buyers, the sellers may be stupid and take that, and then, you know, we it's going right. to sell for whatever it's going to really end up selling for anyway. Right. So there's just a lot of different pieces to it, and I think we have to look at all those. So cool. I just try to make it simple. Great. Thank you. Jeremy? Um, Totally agree with what they've said in the net to seller, making sure the seller understands the, the true benefit. Um, I think that there's some other problems that have come up, and that is um, you'll have buyers that'll do anything to secure a property because they, they don't want to lose that one, um, but it's really not the one they ultimately love or want. They just want something. So I don't know if anybody's had this happen where uh, you know, you go under a contract, multiple offer situation, it gets bid up, up and up, $40,000 over price or whatever, and then seven days later you get a termination agreement in the due diligence. So what we tried to do in multiple, multiple offer situations in representing the seller um, is, you know, we've, we've got a stipulation and a, an assigned document that we send over um, notification to all parties. Um, and it basically notifies them that we're in a multiple offer situation, um, sort of lays that out, and I'll share this with you and anybody who wants it so you can have it. Um, and then I put in there too, it says, in making your final and best offer, please be aware that all things being equal, the offers in which the seller, um, uh, sorry, the offers in which the following special stipulations have been added, the prospective buyer will be at an advantage over those that do not include these stipulations and I've got really one stipulation and it and that says it reads it is understood by all parties that this agreement came as a result of the seller selecting this buyer over multiple other buyers who also presented bona fide offers therefore in the event the buyer terminates this agreement during the due diligence period for any reason other than the seller refusing to address concerns identified in a professional inspection report and presented to the seller in a written amendment to address concerns no later than 48 hours prior to the end of the due diligence period the earnest money shall be dispersed to the seller. Um, and that helped us in a couple <laughs> situations. Yeah, nice. Getting real. And in like manner, I just, I, I, if I knew how to do an Excel spreadsheet, I would, I would do all those. <laughs> <laughs> I would she take those estimate people. of net to seller sheets. I do too. I've got a legal teach sheet. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. But I understand, in theory, what she what you do is great because it goes one step further, that, you know, than the estimate of net to sell sheet. But what what I do instead of this or in lieu of is, if you've been in real estate more than been in real estate more than six years, you know what I'm talking about. Some people don't, but but in lieu of a due diligence period, we just negotiate a, a right to request repairs, and then that way it eliminates that due due diligence right. period and you don't have to do that and we also do a conf I didn't know we were going to get this detail so this is great we also I also do a confidentiality agreement with each each offer so that it can't get bitted you know so you don't have to deal with the escalation clause but remember I'm 99% working for the seller so but we d I, I would prefer the right to inspect, but you have to educate many times, and one of the questions down below is newer agents, you have to educate the other agent to understand, they don't understand the difference between a due diligence period and the right to re request repairs. So it just makes it a stronger con contract to have the right to request repairs instead of the due diligence, but I love that. Did you, yeah, did, that's cool, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Big stuff for everybody. Yeah. Um, Mitch, on the listing side of multiple offers. Well, I want to know where these people get all these listings with all these multiple offers. Because <laughs> I'm thrilled to just get two at a time, to be honest with you. I mean, typically when I... Prospecting. <laughs> when I get multiple offers, it's typically right at the beginning when we list a house. And I'm usually looking at two or three. I mean, if, if I've never had ten, that's great. I just haven't experienced that. So I'm always very cognizant of how 
the timing occurs with each agent because somebody typically is the first one to the table and they want a fast response and you know as a listing agent there are other people out there and you don't want to give a fast response because it might not be beneficial to your seller. So you have to make sure that you play your cards right and the ultimate thing is to not blow it and have nothing. So I know that it sounds glamorous, all these multiple offers, but many times if you don't manage them right, you really look bad and you have high risk to go from big shot with two offers to everybody's mad at you because you didn't handle them right. So I'm always trying to make sure that when an offer comes in, I keep people aware of what the showings are looking like, how many showings we're getting, and when somebody else writes an offer, they already knew an existing offer was there, and you of course have to go back and then go to the first party and say, we received a second offer and we want to make sure that you're on the same footing and that you have an opportunity to change your offer and we're going to have everybody compared at the same time at this time. And I just think keeping everybody equal is really important from a relationship point of view with the other agents. And then after that, it seems the most important thing from the seller's point of view is the combination of, as you all said, the number and really the strength. I just look at the whole thing as the strength. Is this person really going to close? And that's contingency, appraisal, financing, uh, you know, all the things that go into whether you think this person is actually going to close the deal. And if you get a hint that they're just doing one of these, let's tie it up because we want to tie it up, you, you just have to, you have to reflect that in who you deal with. And does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Cheryl, do you want to talk on that for a second, too? Yeah, I think one of, a couple of things that probably haven't been addressed is, I know part of the question was how do you, uh, how do you prepare your seller for it? And I would be careful preparing them for it unless it actually happens. Um, I, you know, you, you know, the worst thing you can possibly do to a seller is tell them they're about to get avalanched with offers <laughs> and then it's crickets at the end of it. Um, but I will say that when you put it, put it on the market on a Friday afternoon and you've got three appointments, you know, scheduled for Saturday, you're probably in pretty good shape. I think one of the things that I see in talking to people at the table, one of the, one of the indications that buyers are just trying to tie up your property is they didn't even come look at it. Um, you know, and there were people that made offers during Snowmageddon and all of those other times because they, they, they just physically couldn't get there. But for the most part, if a buyer really wants to buy the house and they're not, it's not an investor situation, they're actually going to come take a look at it. Um, I can't say enough how accurate everyone is about the fact that highest and best isn't just highest. Um, and best is not just the type of financing that they're doing but who is providing the financing. Trust your history of, I mean, there are companies out here who do an absolutely fabulous job and there are companies that do less so. I mean, and, and we, we have all been there at the closing table with nothing there. Um, you know, if the seller has a timeline at the end of this that's going to be important, it's gonna be extremely important who's providing the financing. I don't, I don't want to speak to whether an agent is new or old, but I'd love to go back down for all you guys and just talk very briefly on the agent on the other side of this. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I think when these multiple offers come in, um, I'd love for you guys to just talk just a minute on, you know, if they've communicated well or what, what the actual agent's bearing is on that. Um, John, here it is, John. Okay. Um, John said he wanted a nugget from me, so here it is. <laughs> the best negotiators in the world are the best listeners. I, if I get an email with an offer and nobody's talked to me about that offer, I pick up the phone and I call the agent. You ready for the golden script? Thank you for the offer. Before I can present your offer, I have some questions. Would you please call me? because I'm not going to present an offer until I have verbally spoken to the agent that sent it. And I use showing time. I'm not pushing showing time, but it's an appointment center. So I know without even going to Supra whether, whether they actually saw the house, but that's a perfect point. And the other thing, let me interject this before I get to the listening part. Trust the real estate attorneys that you work with. They know more than you know about that lender because they deal with them. They know whether they respond or not. So trust them. Trust them and ask them, I got this offer. Are these, you know, are we going to get these people closed? Okay. So the main thing I do is I listen. 
I listen to that agent because you know we talk too much. So I'm going to ask questions and get them to tell me and so I can communicate with them because I, I can't, I do not communicate in an email. I do not communicate with a text. I never negotiate in a text or an email. Now, if I have a conversation and I need to follow up some points, because you know we're in a multi multicultural environment and sometimes you've got to make sure everybody's on the same page, I follow that up with an email, but I listen and talk first before I, before I do anything. So that's how I make sure that I'm not messing up. And still, sometimes you do because people don't tell you the truth. But if you're listening, you can tell they're not telling you the truth. So I listen to them. And, I, and believe me, I, I told you I've only had five, so it's not that many. But, but still, you've got you to gotta listen to them with your ears, not with your fingers, just so you know what's going on. Awesome. Thank you. No texting? No, I will text you, but after I've talked to you. Check in case I ever work with her. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a it's going to be a quiet conversation between the two of us. I think <laughs> she's going to ask a question. There'll be no response. I'll ask a question. There'll be no response. No, I will call you and leave you a voicemail. Okay. <laughs> no talk. No talking. Th that's the key. Uh, I, I can't tell you. You know, as as a managing broker and trainer and, and, and all the things that I've had the the pleasure of doing over the years. Um, typically, you get yourself into trouble when you talk too much. So. If I'm representing a seller, I'm going to do everything I can to get the buyer's agent to talk too much. And it is asking easy. questions. It's easy to do. So the, the, the question I like to, um, a, couple, a couple of them really, but um, it's really just speaking to the offer. And it's one of the questions I like to ask a, um, an agent that's calling me is, um, how did your buyer determine the value of the offer that you've presented? Um, because I want to know, have they given this any thought? Are they just pulling this out of the school? Where is this coming from? And, and immediately that gets them sort of thinking about stuff that they hadn't necessarily been prepared to talk to me about. And that gives me an opportunity to listen and hear everything that's going on in the minds of that buyer's agent at that time because they're doing everything they can not to divulge too much, but they're trying to answer the question because they want to be polite. Um, and then can you tell me a little bit more about the timing involved with your buyer? I like that question because it, it speaks to what kind of situation are they in? Are they in a lease? Are they in a rent? Do they got to buy? they got to sell? They have to be out at a certain time? I need to know these things if I'm going to help my seller choose the best offer in a multiple offer situation. And those are two things to understand. You know, how do they determine the value? Um, are they you know, really going to step up to the plate? Can they? Uh, and two, what's the timing involved with um, with them? So those are two questions I like to ask. Cool, Debbie. I mean, basically, if you're representing a buyer, and even if it's not a multiple offer situation, you want to sell your buyer to the seller because you know, of all the reasons that we talked about. It's 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 personal, and, and particularly depending on on the seller. I mean, if somebody's lived there a year or two, they don't have any attachment or it's investor. That's a whole different thing. But you sell it in a different way. You sell it more the financial end. But if it's if it's a family, I mean, I had one probably 25 years ago where. They had this gorgeous garden, and the people were all about the gardening. And even back then, it was a multiple offer situation. And my people really were stretching to get this house. I mean, they really couldn't pay a whole lot more. And we wrote a love letter back then, and all about the roses. And she could see her children playing in the garden. I mean, it was so sappy. But it was she was that kind of person. I mean, it was it was it came from her heart. Those people sold the house for less money to my people because they wanted somebody to take care of that garden and see somebody's children grow up there. And I've had that happen several times. So as an agent, you got to sell your buyer, you know, to that seller and say, you know, it's not that they don't feel your house is worth more. They really do and they recognize blah, blah, blah. But, you know, she's a teacher and he's a policeman and this is the most that they can pay and you know they want to raise their family there and you know whatever it is and and it needs to be honest and true i mean you can't just make stuff up but well, you can but i wouldn't do that but but um but you know but but so we're still salespeople, you know and i appreciate your point about listening and when we're representing the seller you're listening for those cues and if you know, is this a relo client or is this somebody who's been looking for a house for three years? And you, you know, how many other houses have they made an offer on? 
did they did they back out of any of those hello and the agent will tell you you know whatever the history is did they ever get turned down for a loan I mean especially if they've been driving around for two years yeah yeah I mean you know it kind of it's like if you're dating you know there's I mean it's the same kind of questions you know like okay you're 45 and you've never been married Maybe you're not the best prospect for somebody to me. I don't know. <laughs> I've been married forever. I don't know this. But you know what I'm saying. It's like people have commitment issues sometimes. That's another so time. That's another question. <laughs> but um, <laughs> go ahead. And then I have another question to see if anybody's ever done, um, be thinking about this, and any of y'all. Have you ever done um, a multiple offer situation, which I understand that the Code of Ethics now allows us to do, and I've never done it, where the seller, with seller's permission, that you can tell everybody what everybody else's offer is, like an eBay auction, crazy. I wanted to get back to something you asked. How do you check out the other agent? And I, for years now, I've been doing this. I, I set up a search, and it's an FMLS search, and you can bring in the listing or selling agent by ID. And so I have a search that every time somebody writes an offer, or if I present an offer to somebody, I, I check out how many transactions the agent has had. And I usually start it over at the beginning of the year. So I just put in a, you know, starting at the beginning of January 1st, 2014, and I'll put a minimum price, $10. And I'll say, is this person a selling agent or a listing agent? And you can see whether this agent has experience, at least over the past year. If there's very little, I go back further just to see if this agent was experienced before and has a sabbatical or something. But it's interesting how agents will present themselves to you in a manner that isn't always accurate. Uh, let's put it that way to be nice. It seems to me it's like anything. When somebody comes across as super strong, most of the time they're hiding weakness. If somebody's very rich, they don't have to act rich. Um, if an agent is telling you all the things they've done, I don't really care that you've had three closings this past week. It doesn't really, that's no big deal. I just want to understand what's really going on and, and get to the bottom line. Will this person handle things, or he or she handle things in a responsible manner based upon experience? And aside from that, I really strive to treat every single agent exactly the same. Because in the long run, you're going to be dealing with people again. And people are going to say, I had a bad experience with this agent, Mitch. He stunk. Or I didn't get to, people, you know, how many agents have said, I never want to deal with that agent again? Yeah. And so you have to really be careful that you're going to, you almost want to be, a, I, my approach is to be a positive agent that people would like to work with again, because I think in the end, it'll be helpful when I'm presenting offers on behalf of my clients, and it'll be beneficial, they'll, they'll want to bring buyers to my listings. You know, I don't have, obviously, an agent on another side of a transaction, but, you know, what I was planning on saying is exactly what Mitch just introed into, which is every transaction is you building your reputation for every transaction that you have after this. And what I've seen happen, particularly at the beginning of the multiple offers, when the agents didn't know we were in that market yet, we probably saw it before you guys did, just because we have a a much wider perspective across the horizon of transactions. But what I saw is agents playing tricks uh, to get out of contracts because they wanted to put their people in a different contract. Um, and excuses and, and, you know, probably most of the contracts they were able to get out of, sadly enough, because they were badly drafted and so they actually could get out of them. Um, but. It's a very uncomfortable situation to have with an agent where I know somebody is, is trying to stretch this thing in order to void the contract and get out of it. And I will tell you that whether or not you, you know that, the other agent knows what you're doing. I mean, and, and you do build your reputation for all of this. And most of you have absolutely wonderful reputations and you want to make sure that you maintain those. Cool. So let's, I'm sorry, you have a question? I, you know, I've taught for about a million years. I guess it's only 16. It only feels like a million <laughs> years now. And, and one of the things uh, I, I taught at the very beginning was the Breda uh, information about who you represent. 
and we used to have a chart that went down of what you had to disclose based upon whether or not you were the listing or the selling agent. You, there are certain parts of that chart where you cannot fulfill your obligation to your client if you are sitting on both sides of that transaction. That's one of the reasons that, that, you're, you, know, that you all got together and the, created designated agency to break apart. Because you know, dual used to be if you worked for the same company. And obviously, two, a, two real estate agents from the same company can, can completely represent their client effectively. I, would, I think that you're asking for true liability if you represent both sides of this. And there's this expectation that if you say nothing, then you're doing OK. But sometimes nothing is what you're not allowed to do. Let's, uh, this segues pretty nicely into working with newer agents. So one of the questions that, that we talked about was, um, if you have a newer agent on the other side of the transaction, let's step away from multiple for a minute. Let's just kind of forget that and just say, you have somebody present an offer. Um, you know, a lot of times you can probably even tell from the phone call or even the email, uh, somebody's a lot newer. So why don't we, let's start with Mitch and come down and I'd like to let Cheryl kind of recap because she probably has more of an overview perspective of that. But so how, I guess the question is how would you handle a newer agent on the other side, meaning do you really kind of use that to your advantage and, and kind of drill what you can out of them because they don't know what they're telling you? Or do you kind of coach them and help them so that you can all have a closing or somewhere in the middle? Uh, my job is to represent my buyer or my seller. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm too nice. I just, I'm just a nice person, and I, I'm, I, 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 that's a problem in some instances. But I just feel like I empathize with the, with the agent, and in my mind, I'm going to do the best job and get my client the happiest deal if I'm productive with this other agent. So, typically, what I'll do is I'll explain to my, my client. It appears that this agent isn't very knowledgeable about things. They're, they're missing some things. They didn't put the right exhibit. When you see wrong exhibits attached, when you see wording incorrect, when you see, list, when you see offers or things that aren't filled out properly, you can tell. And in my mind, the best way to handle it is, of course, to, to make sure I look out for my client, make them aware that I think we have somebody who's relatively inexperienced. We can't take total, uh, you know, if you burn a bridge at the beginning of the transaction, it's going to get back to you later. You're going to need a favor somewhere in that transaction. And if you've completely abused the person, you're not going to get it. It, it might come down to extending at the end or just some sort of term. So my approach is to be helpful. And whether that's the right approach or not, I don't know. That's how, that's, that's how I do it. Debbie? I agree. I mean, I remember the – and I've been in the business 33 years, and I could tell you the first agent that I co-opt with. I would rather – that an agent tell me that this is their first transaction or that they're new so that I know that they're new and not just stupid. Because um, if they're stupid, it, you know, you can't really, I mean, that's just hard. But if they're, <laughs> if they're new, you know, you can say, look, let, let's work together. Let me help you. Or, you know, why don't you talk to your broker about this and direct them, you know, back to their broker, which is, I think, the appropriate place for them to go. But, but um, it's in everybody's best interest to get the deal done. And so you want to try to help them. On the other hand, I, I have told my sellers, this is an inexperienced agent and that, that can either be good for us or bad for us. And so we're going to try to make that be good for us and good for them too. And everybody deserves to be represented. So, I mean, I agree with Mitch. You, you always, if you take the high road, you're always come out best. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to go back to a question that Debbie asked earlier, and that's about disclosing off. And I just quickly say no. I've ne I don't. I would never do that. Representing the seller, as far as telling everybody, hey, here's offer A, B, C, D, and here's what they are, so that everybody knows. I just it was a good question, and no. Now I will say on the buy side, that's what I'm going after. So we didn't really talk much about the buy side of a multiple offer situation because it's a completely different strategy. Um, I do use an escalation clause. If you're here because you wanted to get some of that information, I've got it. I'll share it with you. We're done talking about it, I guess. But if you if you want it, I'll be happy to share with you the escalation clause. And it's part of the reason why I'm back in the business because uh, it was kind of fun. And it, it, it gave me an unfair advantage. And I thought, wow, this is kind of neat. And I remember as a broker thinking, escalation clause? We can, let's hop back to that. So we you want to go back? Focus, but let's, I definitely want to hit the buy side. Okay, so we'll talk about it later. Um, 
new agents absolutely it, it's coaching them helping them through the transaction i just i use the term bulletproofing the transaction i mean i think that at the end of the day we want to make sure that both of our clients are protected because it seems like this is something they both want so let's do everything we can to bulletproof the transaction and the and the and the purchase and sale agreement so that we don't run into issues down the road and i noticed that this was in this case or you left this out or this was blank could you get that corrected for us in a, in a quick amendment and we send it over to them, we make it really simple, um, you know, have a, a full-time client services manager and uh, my assistant, and he does all of that, and it's just, you know, we, we try to take as much of the workload as we can off. Uh, you know, we get offers now that aren't on GAR forms, we require that everything that we work is GAR forms, so, you know, that's another step that goes into the, to the mix sometimes. Um, and then the other thing is with, with agents, I'm looking at, am I dealing with somebody who's just a, an, a new inexperienced agent or are they really a frustrated agent working with a very difficult buyer or you know client um, so sometimes you you can get almost on their side and help them figure out a way to work with their buyer or seller um, and a lot of times I'll be giving them <laughs> some things to help make sure that my client doesn't end up in a situation where the other party terminates the agreement because the agent was in it you know, not capable of working with them. They just got so frustrated that they they were at, at kind of odds ends and sometimes that happens. Um, I do use broker metrics to determine how much experience the other agent has and if they have experience in the area that we're working. So if they're bringing me an offer on my listing, I'll look to see how many buyer represented sides they have in that particular area, zip code or county or whatever it is. Um, and that way I know how familiar they are with the area because I work a lot of different areas. Um, and that just helps me sometimes educate them on value um, through the, um, the market analysis and stuff like that so that they can really consult with their buyer to, to help them understand. I think that's it. I wanted to jump in on something Jeremy said. Um, I think conformed purchase and sale agreements are really helpful. When you, when you finally get a contract worked out, a lot of the time it's an offer and then there's counter offer forms and you end up with, let's say, the third counter offer plus the original offer. And I can't tell you how many times lenders don't give the right documents to the appraiser. And so you have appraisal problems simply because they just forgot to add that accepted counter offer in. So while everybody's happy and because you know you have that period where everybody's excited that they got the contract it's before due diligence all the bad stuff happens just get it all done beautifully conform purchase and sale agreement everybody signs it everybody has a copy and you're you're good to go when Carol. when you're doing that uh, one of the a couple of things about it is um, number one remember that there's a special stipulation about the conform contracts and please don't do it without having that stipulation in there so that you can go back to the original if there is an error. We oh, can I hop in for two seconds? Yeah. Everybody know what a conform contract is. Just making a hundred percent. Everybody knows it's a, a rewriting of the same terms on a clean document. I just want to make sure everybody. And, and I will tell you that there are times when, uh, a lot of times when buyers, lenders, short sale lenders, investors, all sorts of people don't know how a counter offer works. So we have had plenty of times when they've said the contract's not signed because obviously we have counter offers. The conformed fixes that. The conformed cleans it up. Closing attorneys actually like contracts they can read when we get it. That's awesome. When we can see what the sales price is. Um, if you do use if you do if you do use counter offers, that's absolutely fine too. I know the way that Howell teaches, and if any of you have, have heard had have heard him teach. He says that if you are going to use the counter offers, put that last counter as the very first page, particularly when it's your sales price. Um, but if you're going to do the conform, just make sure you're using, always make sure you're using the special stipulations that GAR gives you. Those la That language is gold. So for that and for a lot of other things. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. Diane, do you want to speak on the? My head is spinning. Um, <laughs> thank you. That makes perfect sense. Um, what I wanted to say is the, the goal, everybody, I agree with everything everybody said about agents that don't have experience because I remember my first transaction 
and I remember how I was. And I want, and that train comes back around the track. So really, I'm just saying in my own language what they all just said. I'm going to do my, and I do uh, let my sellers know. I'm not smart enough to do that agent metric thing, so I don't even know how to do that. But I do know how to listen. So, and I do know how to look at a license number. You know, so I can do it that way. But um, I just want to make sure my seller knows, look, we're dealing with some inexperience here, but we can make this work. And I'm going to be just as nice. This is why I say you can't be too nice. Nice gets nice. So I'm going to be really nice to that agent. I've got one right now. We had to put it on a GAR, just like my broker will. By the way, my broker will not allow dual agency, and my broker has to have everything on a GAR. So when I rewrite it, I try to do it exactly the way the RE form is, but I'm also going to make, when they say they've got 10 days financing contingency, I'm going to give them 10 days financing contingency because that's what they say. And the most important thing about a new agent that I've found from my experience is I'm going to know that lender better than their buyer knows that lender. Because if they don't know how to do a contract, then they also don't know which lenders are the good lenders. And the lender is ultimately the one that's going to make us or break us. So we got to know who that, if, I'm going to, I've already called the lender on the one that I just did a GAR form on yesterday. I already know that lender very well and he's programmed in my phone and I'm programmed in his because I guarantee you this sweet young agent doesn't know how to deal with her buyer's lender. And that's, that's the part that, that's the only thing I would inject. It took me a long time to inject it. Awesome. But no, that was great. That was great. Um, let's do a couple of questions. I guess it me. I guess the question is, what do you mean by updated? If you're going to take the original of it and make a change to it and have everyone initial off on it, um, if, you're, if you're trading out it's in the middle of it, since there's not date and time stamps at the bottom of those things, I think that there's. Think of it from from the perspective of somebody who wasn't on those phone conversations, trying to just look at the paper and figure out what was happening because that's what the judge is going to do. Um, and everything, it's, it's the whole four corners thing. The, the, your contract is a timeline. Your contract is a trail. As long as somebody who wasn't on that phone call can see what was happening and knows what the parties agreed to, then you've done okay. Um, I've seen, you know, trading out pieces of paper um, is going to be a lot more problematic than making changes to things or adding pages behind it. But I do agree that at the end of the day, the cleanest, the cleanest contract is also the easiest in terms of financing and everything else. I'm just going to interject real quick and I, and I listen to the question. It's a really good question. And one of the things you said is when the agent and I agree on the phone, um, that's probably where you might have messed up. <laughs> So there should be no need to go back and put it on the original form because what you get in an agreement is a signed document that is acceptable and binding. So you wouldn't go back and change that without an amendment or doing a confirm, conformed agreement, right? So it's just you have to be really, really careful, I think, in agreeing on the phone for something and then going back and writing it up that way and then sending it over you've given somebody time to then change their mind and it just it opens it up so um, I'd say don't agree on the phone yeah no absolutely and I think it was probably Mitch or Cheryl that probably taught me this but I, I, I know I personally always thought about what will a judge say when you're sitting there when you need to have documented evidence not like well they told me that or you know remember our email said that we would move the closing date I just dealt with this actually within our own team, where somebody had said, oh yeah, we'll move the closing up, and then the other one said, well, no, we never agreed to that, and it's, it's always better to just have it, have it written down. I, I never negotiate anything verbally, ever. Everything has to be in writing from the beginning. Maybe, okay, maybe, 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 if we're at the very end and the only thing that's going back and forth is the price, then we can say, okay, let's, let's follow up. But 
there's never somebody has to submit an offer in writing. We have to make a counter offer in writing. They have to give us a counter offer in writing because I, long ago I remember a situation where I thought I had a contract and then the person didn't sign it. We had an agreement. Everybody agreed except something somebody better came in. And uh, so if it's not in writing, it's nothing. And I actually this is something I never tell my seller an offer is coming in. I never ever say anything. I never say any, somebody says I'm writing an offer. They may, they may not. You know, when I get the offer, I have an offer. I tell my seller I have an offer, and here it is. And the same thing, I don't ever call a now. This is something I don't call a listing agent and say I'm writing an offer. Why would I do that? That gives them notice to tell all the other people they sh that have shown the house there might be somebody writing an offer. Hustle your people up and get that offer in. So I. I mean, I'll communicate with the listing agent plenty, but I will never give them advance notice. I want to be writing up that offer, emailing it to them, and calling them and saying, did you just get the offer I emailed over to you? Perfect. That's uh, You have to be very clear. And I, unless I have an offer, I don't have an offer. That's how I look and, at and it. And this is coming from, from the friendly real, real estate agent. But at the end of the day, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, he's absolutely correct. And, and, and more than just negotiating tactics and all of those other things, which I clearly understand as a lawyer, the other thing that everybody needs to realize is that until it's on paper, I don't think you know whether you've actually come to what we officially call a meeting of the minds. You know, we all make assumptions in our own head, and we don't realize, we honestly don't realize those assumptions that we make. So until it's on paper, I, I don't think that you're all literally on the same page. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, you have a question in the back? <laughs> he can handle it. Okay. They're not that good. <laughs> Are you really sharing a mic? Are you guys really sharing a mic? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. Can take yours for a second? Do this. Can you use the microphone, please? Yeah. Uh, I'm a, uh, an associate broker, previous managing broker, and uh, run a small team for real estate um, sales. There you go. Okay, in the last couple of days, I heard someone say that you cannot modify a GAR contract, meaning you, that whatever is there, you can't line through it and initial it, date and time it, like I was taught when I took real estate years ago. So that's one question. <laughs> that's the person whose mic I just took. She's an attorney. Yeah. And the second question is, but uh, uh, just focus it in on what he said, and then you can help him out. She's trying to get I me believe you said, and this lady in the white jacket, too. You said that my broker requires that we use a GAR contract form. Right. So the question is, do you actually have a suggested format for every offer? Do you post it in the listing with all the possible uh, uh, exhibits like seller's disclosure and potential finance, whatever, whatever, whatever? Do you? actually post that in your listing or do you provide that for everybody that that's makes a good question. an offer? That's a good question. Have that posted in, in the offer, in the listing, when we get the offer or when we get communication that there's one coming in, I'll send the documents over to the other agent so that they have everything. Um, but, you know, it's really not. Again, I sort of say it's not up to me to tell them what they need or don't need. Um, I, I'm not going to tell them that they need a financing contingency because I don't know if they do. And I represent the seller, so I don't want to advise them to put that in there. I don't want them to advise, advise them to do a appraisal contingency or anything else or special stipulations. So I don't have that list. I mean, it's a purchase and sale agreement. You send me over the document with what you believe the terms are that your buyer is willing to pay and all the rest of them. Um, and then I'll translate that on, put that onto the GAR form, and I'll send it back to you with um, with a with a request that you know w we've been advised to have all um, contracts be negotiated on the GAR form. And I've taken your information, I've I've put it um, on this form in our counteroffer, 
if you have questions, you know, let me know, and I'll, I'll help answer any of the questions I can about the forms. You're, you're not under contract right at that point, so it acts as a counteroffer. You don't have an agreement, so you're not modifying an existing agreement. Uh, with respect to striking lines out of the, the GAR contract, um, this, this goes back to the fact that drafting a contract is actually the practice of law. And it, it's not just because we like a lot of control over things, it's because legal legal words have important meanings. Um, I will say that if you have uh, not used a GAR three paragraph addendum or you have struck you know half a contract and wrote one sentence to replace it, there's probably in all honesty an error in there. Uh, the, the, the most common error is there's absolutely no contingency for what happens if that sentence doesn't happen. Uh, so I will, the practice of law is that drafting, you all are completing the contracts, but if you don't have a closing attorney who is willing to help you, um, you know, just give us a call. Diane, let's, let, we, we got a key, we have a short yeah. time frame. These guys will be here after if you want to speak to them on specifics. Diane, do you want to? Ma'am, I'm sorry, we have a very limited amount of time for everybody to cover a lot of topics. Okay, we, re we really need to continue, I'm sorry, because other people have questions as well. Okay, so you guys, I think we want to get into, excuse me, go ahead. Okay. Shortly, um, if you want something, a specific obligation to survive the closing, you need to write an amendment that says that it survive, that item survives the closing. Uh, but there is liability attached to that contract for everybody who executed it that potentially goes past the closing date. It can be litigated afterward. But if you're trying to get something done after the time of the settlement, you need to say so. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to do because you don't have a whole lot of sway once people have their proceeds. Cool. Okay. Would now, you guys I do want to answer that? one thing. In the, in the FMLS, um, when I have a listing, my standard is the CBS code is in the private documents, but I put for the convenience of your vendor so people don't call me and say, why do I need a CBS code to show this house? So I make sure they understand it's for the appraiser or the inspector or whoever. And I also put all the disclosures from Exhibit A through whatever, Exhibit A, B, C, and D, whatever. I've also put those in the forms, in the documents, in the listings, so they're there for anybody that, that wants to give them to their buyers. So I, I have them there because when you have a lot of listings, you can't just be sending documents all day long. So let's do a quick show of hands because we have a couple things I think we're probably not going to get to. So let me let's do a quick vote on what you guys would rather cover. Um, one of those being the buy side, multiple offers. Um, I would say beyond that, uh, we had something here on new construction, um, negotiating repairs, and then communication, which we hit on a little bit. Communication kind of the texting, like we talked about, the texting versus the phone calls for different portions of the transaction. So let's, let's do a quick vote on those four things. Um, uh, we'll do honor system. I'll, you can vote twice. Um, but let, let's do a quick vote on those four things to see what's most important to you guys to cover. So the first thing would be negotiating multiple offers on the buyer side. Okay. Um, and the second thing would be the new construction, negotiating new construction. Okay. And um, negotiating repairs and, and Later things in the transaction, okay. Um, and then communicating different ways throughout different parts of the transaction. All right, cool. So we got, we got clear winners there. So let's circle back to um, buy side.
On, on, okay, so we'll cover that under the buy side. We'll make, we'll make that our B of, that's 2B if memory serves correctly. Um, so, okay, so let's start with buy side, managing multiple offers when you work with the buyer. I pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeremy. There you go. Um, so the escalation clause, uh, special stipulation, if I know that I'm in a multiple offer situation, um, I want to be, one, very friendly, if uh, at all possible, with the listing agent. I want to communicate however they like to communicate. If, it's, if they're texting, I'm going to text. If they're calling, I'm going to call. If they're emailing, I'm going to email. I am going to communicate with them. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to understand what type of behavioral profile they are. Um, I believe that you can relate to people um, when you speak to them at their level. So if, if they're speaking very softly and quietly and, and slower, I'm going to speak to them that way. When, they, when I call and I listen to their voicemail um, and I hear how they speak in their voicemail, I'm going to leave my voicemail to mirror their tonality and, and rate of speech so that they feel comfortable. They like me. And it helps get a call back. It helps communicate there to build a relationship because I'm going to have to have this person want my buyer to win. And sometimes it's just knowing that they're working with a really professional agent that's going to bulletproof the transaction and is going to make sure that this goes to closing. And I want them to know that. I want them to know that's what I'm working for. Um, but the escalation clause to, to position us reads, in the event that the seller receives one or more and I'll give this to you, it's just other bona fide, bona fide offers where the terms equal a higher net, that's what we're talking about, to the seller than the net presented herein and before this offer is accepted, then the purchase price of our offer shall be increased by whatever. It's usually a few thousand dollars, 3,000, 5,000, it depends on the price point, um, for a purchase price of blank above the other offer. Offer not to exceed a final purchase price of whatever we put our top number in. Um, and I've had to explain this a lot uh, sometimes, and particularly to, to sometimes banks and different things when, it first, when, it, when I first started using it. Um, and then I also put in that upon binding agreement, the seller shall provide a buyer, the buyer with a copy of the other offer that caused the increase in the buyer's purchase price. So I don't want to see it right now, but you will provide it to me so that we can verify that we're paying $5,000 over another acceptable offer that you had. The, the buyer the buyer can terminate but we are in due diligence at that point and I'll and I have it because it's supposed to happen upon binding agreement so um, you know if, if for some reason the due diligence got negotiated out then we would add a special stipulation that says that that notification or, t or form is not presented in a timely manner within 48 hours of binding agreement the buyer may at buyers um, choice in writing um, terminate the agreement so I think that's it Cool. Mitch? Well, oh, question. I think you the can. Question is, I, I think, can you repeat the question, please, Cheryl? Oh, yeah. She's question. asking about what happens if the other offer that you've now obligated yourself to prove and show existed also included a confidentiality agreement. I, I think I would have a conversation with uh, with the other buyer's agent about that, but I also believe you can redact that document to the point where you've abided by the confidentiality. Uh, he doesn't care who the names are of the other people. He just wants to make sure he's not being lied to, and that's and I think you can do that, and you can and you can you know well, still I, protect confidentiality. And I tell you. It's, I'm not being lied to. I know you have other offers. There's no doubt in my mind. I have never experienced an agent, not one time, tell me that they had an offer in writing that they didn't have. It just never happened. I, I can't imagine anybody would ever do that. And I make sure my buyers know that. That doesn't mean that my buyer doesn't question it from the start. So it helps my buyer feel comfortable and confident in moving forward. And at the end of the day, if my buyer feels comfortable and confident with you as a listing agent and your seller, then that's going to help us get to closing. 
So I appreciate the fact that you have this, but I think that the only way to really move forward and to help make sure that we're bulletproofing the transaction, and that would be the script that I would use as I'm trying to help the seller feel comfortable with what we're what we're doing and how we're negotiating it. Cool, Mitch, did you have something on that? Yes, Mr. Barnes. Yeah. Uh, no, because it gives the seller the highest possible net of any transaction up to a certain amount. And if I, unless there's two escalation clauses and then you sort of run into, all right, well, which one is a little bit higher than the other? Maybe if they're the exact same number, you know, uh, we just haven't ran into it. Uh, there are, there are, so, there are not, a, there, there really, it, it seems like, gosh, everybody could use this, so they don't. I have multiple offers all the time on listings. Fortunately, not on every one. I've had one, you know, and I get there. But I have a thought. Yeah, on, Mitch, but I don't know about. I don't handle escalation clauses. I think the way that I wouldn't really respond very well to an escalation clause presented to my listing, and I'll tell you why. Usually, when you're having multiple offers, you pretty quickly get to a highest and best situation, and the highest and best, in my mind, is the highest and best. So if somebody gives me an offer and then writes an escalation clause that says, but I'll go up a little bit more up to this amount, then I feel like that top amount is their top dollar. So if I would like to give them a counter offer back at their top dollar, I am free to do so. But I probably, this is just me now thinking out loud, I, I would not necessarily, I, I kind of feel like that's a gimmick that's trying to get, and I don't like gimmicks. I just like straight up what's going to you know what's the best for my client and if somebody's i feel like somebody is trying to maneuver their way into the top and that's so i don't particularly care for that that's just my opinion um Debbie, did you want to speak on that as well um it depends on who's i'm representing <laughs> um well we're yeah no, i mean right. i've definitely i've used it for 25 years i mean i learned it years and years ago from Mike and Harriet Henson, some of y'all know Mike and Harriet. I was like, can you do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, cool. So I have used it, you know, uh, when I represent buyers. When I'm representing the seller, I don't really like it as much because I think it's very confusing to everybody and there's some mistrust there. But I certainly have ended up getting a lot more money for some of my sellers. And sometimes if you have a lot of multiple offers, it's so confusing you're just better off going back and getting highest and best. So it just depends on the situation. There's a lot of if, if then kind of. Stuff. And again, I really go back to the strength of the contract. To me, that's more important than the price. Right. Um, getting back to what we were starting to talk about here, which is what do you do from a buyer's point of view? I think as a buyer's agent, it's real important when your person likes a house and you can tell that there's a lot of activity. You've got to counsel them right from the beginning. How strong do you want to be? And I always, in my mind with negotiating, you really always want to stay one step ahead of your person and the other parties and anticipate what the next moves are going to be and also the emotional issues if you don't get what you want. Because many times buyers, they fall in love with this house and that's the house. And you say to them, okay, look, there's multiple offers. If we don't get this house, are we, going to, are we always going to be comparing every other house forever to this house? And if their answer is, yes, I, this is the house, then I tell them, you have got to go in as strong as you can Every line item that you're putting in that contract can be improved, and let's just go through it like step by step. Every single thing that we're filling in, do we need it? Does it have to be that difficult? Can't we just make it simple? Can't we make it more beneficial? And of course, talk to the listing agent and find out what the timing is right from the get-go so that we make it positive. On the other hand, if your buyer says, I really like this house, but it's kind of early in the process. I'm not willing to go off the deep end. There's going to be others. That's a different approach. And then you can kind of feel good about maybe not necessarily going in full guns blazing. 
I think that when we don't understand what our client's position is on this, we get into trouble because I might think it's the best house in the world for these people and I'm trying to push them to make this great offer and they're thinking, this guy is so pushy. We don't, we don't like his style. He's, he's trying to get us to, he's just trying to get more commission. And so I think the, the first thing with the, from the buyer's point of view is to really establish, do I have to go full bore on this house? Yeah, just quickly, I can say this just from my experience with knowing who these people on this panel are. If I've got an agent that's going to bring me an escalation cause like Jeremy, then I or like you, I'm going to know who I'm dealing with. But I agree with, in my heart of hearts, when I first see it, I've got to look at the whole situation before I could say, tell my seller, we don't want to do this. And you know, I don't really like the new rule. I'm jumping in here about. If your seller wants, if your seller wants you to tell everybody what the offer is, you can do that. I try not to get myself in that situation because I don't. Again, the train comes back around the track, and I want it when somebody sees my name on a listing. I want them to want to show that listing, not say, "Oh Lord, there's Diane Bryant. She's going to kill us," you know, or "We're going to kill her." So, so I want that to be because you want to get the best for your client. And if, I, if Jeremy's going to send me an escalation clause, then I'm going to talk to Jeremy about it. If you, and I'm sorry, my brain just went dead. Debbie, I mean, Debbie's not hard. People call me that all the time. I mean, if Debbie sends me one, I'm going to talk to my client about who that agent is and, and what's going on with that. So I, I don't say I will never have one, but, I, you know, I'm going to have to re I'm gonna have to think hard so about it. I want to get back to buy side beyond the escalation clause, but I absolutely want to give Cheryl a minute to talk legally escalation clause, if, if you want to. Let me just say one more thing. Uh, even though I hardly ever work with a buyer, I would always do the right to request repairs instead of a due diligence because it makes your offer stronger. Do you want to explain the difference in that? Because that was 07, 06, does that change? Yeah. Okay. Before 06 or 07, everybody had the right to request repairs. There was no due diligence. If I'm saying it correctly, the due diligence was set up so that you could get every Contingency in one thing, appraisal, financing, inspection. And so you didn't have a whole bunch of different um, contingencies at one time. But it also gave you the right to just walk away for any reason. With the right to request repairs, the only reason you can get out of the contract during that time is if there is a, a functional default in that house that the seller will not be willing to, to, to repair. That's the only thing they could walk away for, not just because they went next door to a new construction site and decided to buy that house instead of yours, which happened to me last weekend. <laughs> uh, nice. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? No, no, I'm not marking as is. Where it looks, where it puts due diligence, she asked me, am I marking as There's is in the contract? There's an exhibit. And where, where you say on the first page where it says the due diligence is, I put C step. And then when I get to the stipulate when I get to the stipulation page and the exhibit page, I put the right to request repairs and there is of F of F I think it's I don't know. I don't want to give you the wrong form number, but it's in the forms. It's in the GAR forms. It's the, under miscellaneous, the right to request repairs. And I use that instead of a due diligence period. Jeremy brings me that, he's not going to have to do an escalation clause. Because that means that buyer is committed to buying that house. They're not going to go next door to the new construction site tomorrow and call up Jeremy and say, we don't want to buy that house now. We want to buy this one. You got a new tagline, Mitch. It, it worked. I've got him fooled. Um, that's a great question. I also tell people that when we're in a multiple situation, multiple offer situation, and you want to go for it, you're, you're going to come down off of this high later, okay? And you're going to say, why did I do this? I mean, I'm, you're sitting there after, an, let's say that you have a 45-day close. 
and everything's so exciting at the beginning. You're so thrilled, and you get the house, and you go through due diligence, and all of a sudden, on day 30, you know, you think, wow, did I overpay? And, and so you've got to make people aware that you, however much your, your upper limit is, I personally think it has to do with your time horizon for the house. So if somebody says to me, I'm looking to buy this house, and then I'll say, well, how long do you think you might stay in this house? And if they say, this is it, I mean, I'm going to raise my kids here and they're two. I'm going to stay in this house for 20 years. I say, you may be overpaying for this house a little bit if you go in like this, but so what? In the end, you get the house you want, you have your life you want, you're good. On the other hand, if they say, we, my job is going to be four years, I have to tell them, you may be really excited about this house, but you've got to really keep an eye on the ball down the road in four years. We don't know that we're going to be able to get this back. And I almost try to talk them out of going in too high. Now, you also temper that with the comparables that you see, and of course, whether you do keep the appraisal contingency in the offer. Because if you're in multiple offers, one of the temptations is to remove the appraisal contingency in order to make yours stronger. If you do that, you're kind of just, do they also have the ability to, 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 to pay the difference? Do they have $20,000 right. cash? Because sure. if they're putting, another reason to go in really high is because you're weak. So if you're putting 5% down, and everyone else is putting all cash or 20% down, you have to compensate by going in really high. The problem is if you're way over the appraisal, you've got to make up that difference in cash, and some people can't. So you've got to explain all those different facets to someone, and then at the end, let them make their own decision. Cool. Awesome. Cheryl, do you want to talk for a minute about just like general legality stuff on <laughs> all that? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I will say, and, and what I was going to say was, do they have the 20000 in cash? I mean, you know, if the comps are 405 and you're going to go in 425 make sure that they understand you all negotiate contracts every day. They do this once every 10 years if they've ever done it before in their lives. Okay, so do they actually realize that that means that they could stroke a check for an extra 20000 above whatever they were planning on coming to closing with already? Uh, with regard to the, the right to request repairs really, really quickly, uh, one of the reasons that it was, uh, it was removed was to try and simplify things a little bit. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, negotiating, uh, I think probably five years of my life, trying to decide what the definition of a defect was. That being said, in these sorts of situations where you're trying to make sure that the buyers are real, I mean, you know, due diligence, they can get out because the sky was the wrong color that day. So clearly going back to the right, request, right to request repairs means it's real, but it also means they have to go through, you know, who inspects the house the timelines, all of those things that got messed up a lot before 2007. Just be very careful when you were using it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, and that's why it still exists as a special step. Cheryl, does it still operate the same way that it used to, whereas if you do not negotiate the repairs, the contract is voided, correct? Is exactly. It still that way? One, one of the hardest learning points for people when we went from repairs to due diligence was what happened at the end of the timeline because it's exact, you know, if the seller doesn't respond, because the who has to act is different on right to request repairs than it is for due diligence. If at the end of the due diligence period the buyer hasn't terminated, um, then, then they have to buy the house. The, the stipulation, and you'll want to go back and read it as it, exi as it exists right now, and I will say I never give an actual legal opinion about a contract based upon what somebody else is telling me that it says, so I always want to read it. The forms committees make big changes once a year. They make little changes through the year. Please don't assume you know what's in those documents, um, but, but what happens at the end of that period as to whether or not you still have a contract, it operates differently. Awesome. You have to be aware of that, and make, and make all, and you make all parties aware of that, especially if you're dealing with an agent who's never even had one. Right. Okay. Cool. So, in order to get to some questions at the end before we're totally done, let's go down the line um, and talk about uh, the documents beyond the contracts. Probably most most repairs, but if somebody wants to touch on a financing contingency or things like that. Um, Let's make sure everybody has an opportunity for that, and let's try to weave in the communicating about that as well, like the texting versus email versus call. Hey, we're asking for a bunch of repairs. Can we make this happen? Uh, I'll start with you, Diane. Well, I'm going to respond with an email after we talked. I don't 
you think I'm not going to, I don't <laughs> think I can't text her, but, but you, but Susan, you know me, I'm not going to negotiate with a text. But anyway, it, it depends, it's situational for me. Some sellers are electrical contractors, so they're happy to, you know, do repairs. So what I do is when I get the inspection, uh, when I get the right to request repairs, um, or I'm sorry, that's not the right amendment. When I get the amendment to address concerns, I, I, I talk to the agent about it and I find out, first of all, can you tell me what, out of these 112 items, what are the top 10? You know, or what are the most important things? What are the most important, if I have a question about something, I look over it before I ever send it to my seller and I call the inspector and ask questions. But I find out, you know, what this means exactly. If they're not pictures, I ask for them. And then I send it to my seller. I try to make sure that I do put a special step in my contracts that in a due diligence period that they have a certain time limit to get me that amendment to address concerns. They don't wait till the day before the due diligence is over and then send me an amendment to address concerns. So I try to tighten up that time and then I send it to my seller and I say here it is tell me what these are the things that are really important to them tell me what you want to do or do we want to get a termination release and put it back on the market just call me tomorrow and that's how I handle it and then I we go from there um, yeah pretty much the same the same thing and I, I think agree. yeah definitely I, I think that the, the biggest thing with it is is the phone conversation when it gets down to it you say you got to really pick up the phone and figure out okay tell me tell me where we are, where we are on these things and it really is just going to depend what kind of list did I get and if I've got a ridiculous list then you know I have to sort of look to the other agent and I go boy it just really seems like these people don't want this house you know help me understand their situation and and so that I can explain it to the seller that they actually do want this home because I'm sort of getting the feeling that they don't and you know, just having that conversation and really, that's when you find out, are they frustrated or, you know, do you need to help them? Um, I prefer, I think it's best in, in all situations to try to work out some sort of monetary agreement. I think that the seller ends up a lot of times maybe doing repairs that they, they think were done okay and they, they used to be a contractor or whatever it is. Um, and that doesn't bode well sometimes for for potential litigation afterwards, but you know it's it's just like I, I think that if you can kind of negotiate an agreement up front, whether it's additional money towards closing costs, which is usually how we do it, um, I just find that that's better for everybody. The buyer gets the work done that they want. They're able to see the inside of the walls when the walls are taken apart. Instead of just having the repair done and looking at the finished product, they're able to see it and make a decision as to whether or not, yeah, it's going to require a little bit more, and yeah, it's going to cost them a little bit more, but they get the choice as to whether or not they're going to do it or not. If the seller does it, the seller may not care about it, whereas the buyer did, and you know how that goes. So we negotiate as much as we can on both sides. I don't care if I'm on the selling side or, or the listing side. I usually will push towards a monetary um, agreement and usually closing costs. I don't I don't do I don't do in lieu of repairs it's two different amendments so basically what ends up happening is is if you have an amendment to address concerns um, you know there's an amendment to address concerns and whatever it is it's usually very simple something stupid that we agree to everybody agrees and then uh, there's another amendment amendment number two closing cost shall be increased to from seven to five thousand to seven thousand period and that's it. This is just two separate amendments, two complete different things going on. I think all parties, I've probably learned this from one of you guys too, but I think the all parties agree is usually the key to success. Just Even if the lender asks you why, all parties agree. Yeah, don't use in lieu of repairs. Lenders don't like that. I'm saying amendment to the agreement. All parties acknowledge and agree that the closing cost shall be seven thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, and and the best thing is there's a pre-printed form. We just fill in the blanks. We don't even have to write it. <laughs> That's the best thing. It's literally pre-printed, and you can change the closing possession. You can change the closing costs. It's right there in a pre-printed form. You don't have to write it. 
Yes, uh, oh, there's Debbie. some really good questions probably coming. I don't know. Yeah, let's save the question. I want to make sure all these guys go because I know there's probably a lot of questions about this. Okay. I take it one step further, and um, I either I go in person or if I can't go in person, then somebody from my team, if I'm the listing agent, goes to the inspection at the end. Um, and most agents are okay with that. Sometimes they are not happy that we're there. But usually, I just go and say, hey, uh, you know, introduce myself. I just want to see if you have any questions. I wanted to meet you guys. You know, I'm just sort of Southern and friendly, and they, it, it is fine. And then most of the time, they aren't even there anyway because they don't come to their own inspections. The agents aren't there. The buyers aren't there. I don't understand that. But, um, and as a buyer's agent, I am there the entire time with that inspector. I mean, unless there's some major something going on, and I have to go at the end, but I think you have to be a handholder because that's where you lose the deals. And if I'm not there to see what the inspector is talking about and hear and have them point out what board on the left side of the right side of the ridge of the back of the whatever that they're talking about, you know, trying to read those reports sometimes is very difficult to really see and you fix the wrong thing or you're negotiating over the wrong thing. But A, I think it tells them that the, the seller's representative cares enough to be here to see what's going on. And I get to meet the people. I see how excited or not excited they are. I you know, learn a little bit about the agent. I get a feel for the inspector if I don't already know them. And some inspectors will share with you. Some of them won't. And sometimes it's a waste of time. But a lot of times, we really, at that point, form a relationship to say, we're all here to try to get through this together. So you know, tell me what's going on. I'm the one that's going to have to explain it to the seller. So keeping secret from me is really not in anybody's best interest. So let's work together and get that done. Related to repairs, I always think, first of all, you need to have as a listing agent a good handyman contractor that can pretty much do your estimates for you one-stop shop. So you can immediately tell how much this whole list is going to cost. And that really helps the seller because that way they don't, they're always wondering, who do I get to do this stuff? And I agree with Jeremy 100%. If you can just translate it to dollars, you're good to go. But then a couple of, well, one other thing for sure. When a seller does agree to repairs, what I've found is that you need to tell each contractor that you're going to hire that you want their receipt to be worded exactly as it's stated on the amendment to address concerns. I mean, if, if we have to do da 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 da, then it has to say exactly that on their receipt. Because how many times has the seller, in, in earnest, hired somebody to do a repair? And the buyer says they didn't do the job. And we, so there's a big argument about it. I want it to be the contractor's problem. Because if, if we say we did exactly what was asked for, and it's not done correctly, I bring my contractor back over and say, you didn't do what was asked for. And that way, you keep a lot of disagreements out of, you know, again, we're, I like what Jeremy says about bulletproofing. You want to just keep everything going smooth. And the easiest way to do that is to agree exactly to what they asked for and have that documented. Last thing, with a buyer, when I'm working with a buyer and they, they have an inspection, I always try to tell them, because they'll say, what should we ask for? You know, there's, a whole, there's always so much to ask for. And I, the first thing I'll say is anything that is safety or danger related, you should ask for. Most sellers would expect that. The second thing is our mechanical systems working in normal operating condition. You would expect any house you buy typically. After that, it's really just what do you want to try to get and if you don't want to have to deal with it. But I say if you just use the framework of safety and mechanical operating systems, you can justify asking for those things to anyone. Right, and structural, of course, yes. So after that, if they get anything else, it's just because they're trying to avoid paying money. And to that, to that very point, when I get a listing, I try to talk to my sellers about, have you had your mechanicals inspected? Can you go ahead and get that done so we can have documentation about that? Have you, is your electric panel, you know, up to code? And, and get them to, and if I know, I know a lot about FHA. So if I see something that I believe is a code violation, I go ahead and dress that at the beginning of the listing because it's going to come up later. And, and those codes change, so I have several inspectors that I confirm with all the time. Is this still, if the porch is still 36 inches off the ground, does it have to have a, have a railing? You know, those kind of things. And if you do that when you get the listing, then you don't have nearly as many problems when you get an inspection report. But there's always going to be something. That's their job. I think that you're better off 
exactly what you're saying, Mitch, to put the major things, maybe you throw in a couple of little throwaway things just to give you something to, to negotiate. But when you get a laundry list of, like you say, in, je in jest, but it's happened, you know, hundreds of things, I mean, it just, at that point, nobody want, is negotiating in good faith. It just turns everybody off. And then the, the buyer's like, well, they only did four of the hundred things. You know, like, really? So, so I, you have to sit down with the buyers and help them be realistic and put them in the, in the position. You're buying a 40 year old house. You know, you're getting it at this price. Um, so let's be realistic. You're going to redo the bathrooms anyway, so who cares if the sink is dripping a little bit? You know, things like, and really break it down, and let's go for the important things that we didn't see. What makes me madder than anything is people, the buyers come back on the inspection with things that they saw when they were walking through the house. I mean, really? So don't, don't put those in an inspection moment. You didn't need an inspector to find that. You put in there the things that you couldn't see, whether it's the heat and air or whatever, you know, things that you just couldn't see. The, the things that I've seen, and I will say I had a buyer's agent. I remember my husband asked for something when we were looking for our second house, and it was a plantation shutter thing. And the agent looked him straight at the face and said, you saw that when you saw, that was part of your offer. When you made your offer, you had already mentally factored that in. Um, but the things that I have seen related to inspections that have kept us from getting to closing or getting to funding or getting to the paycheck at the end is on, for everybody is uh, number one, the quality of the work subjectively, you know, the seller's never going to do as good a job for somebody else as they would do if this was something that they were doing for themselves. Um, if you put some of these items in the contract, the lender is going to surprise you at the last moment with a requirement that they re-inspect the property for something they don't care about. For my own sister-in-law's house, I had to go back out to a house with an appraiser to make sure carpeting was replaced. The appraiser didn't care if the carpeting was replaced, but it was required by the loan. Um, not getting, you can't ask for money when you use the right to request repairs. That's not the way that it's created. That's not, that doesn't mean you can't reduce it to money at the end of it all, but just make sure that you're phrasing it correctly. Obviously with due diligence, that was one of the reasons, other reasons that we switched to due diligence. It just got a whole lot easier to drive everything down to a dollar that was happy for everybody. We don't get to closing because the seller doesn't get it done. And sometimes it's because nobody was following up to make sure that they got it done. Maybe the listing agent is a little bit new and just assumed their seller was going to get these items done. But I will say that both sides have an interest in making sure that if something's supposed to be getting done, and when it requires that you order things, those things have to be in ahead of time. Let's expect there's going to be a weather delay. Let's expect that there's going to be a vendor who doesn't perform at 100% because it's not going to happen. When you write the contracts from the very start, leave yourself some wiggle room with seller pay closing costs so you can reduce these items to a dollar amount. When you cap out the seller pay closing cost at the very beginning of the offer because you have hit the limit of their loan program or the limit of the amount of closing costs that actually exist, you haven't even given yourself 200 bucks to settle the stupid thing that happens at the walkthrough on the way to closing. Um, checks to vendors, I know we did them for decades, but let's just assume that my favorite, honestly, because the last thing is that in lieu of repairs is probably the kiss of death for a contract, um, but let's just assume that in lieu of structural repairs, 250 to Home Depot is not going to be something. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I have one other thing on this. When, when, you, when a buyer wants to ask for repairs, it's very difficult from a seller and listing agent's point of view if they just say, do items 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 12 in the report. And then you try to get that, it never works. And I think it's really worthwhile to, as a buyer's agent to make your buyer go through everything and write it all down with you because it's a pain in the neck. And you can talk them out of half of the things while you're going through them. So, uh, you know, because, it, I mean, who say wants to say that out loud? Right. Brilliant, Mr. Nice Guy. Well, that is the worst thing. I mean, I, I like doing all the transactions, but if I'm working with a buyer, the day that I have to sit down and look at that inspection report, figure out how to write it up, 
deal with everything. That is the worst day of the entire transaction. And if you bring the buyer into that, they realize, oh my gosh, what a pain. Forget these five things. Let's just ask for the big things. It helps oh, out. Really awesome. So we're technically at the end of our time, but if you, I know you guys have some questions. I'd love for you to stick around and do questions. I just want to um, be super clear. When you ask a question, whoever's going to answer, if you guys could repeat the question, because we are actually recording and we can't hear your question. And I want everybody to have a fair shot at that. So if you need to go, we certainly understand. If you could roll out quietly, we'd appreciate it. Love to have you stay and uh, ask some questions and chat with these guys. Yes. Correct. Can you re-answer? So the question is, um, we receive as a listing agent an amendment to address concerns with a list of items that are requested by the buyer to be completed by the seller prior to closing. And we counter as a seller with um, a monetary agreement, ad additional money towards closing costs or something of those lines. Uh, we do not sign the amendment to address concerns. No, we would we would do a different amendment to address concerns because we're countering your amendment to address concerns with our new amendment to address concerns, which says um, that there are no concerns and therefore the buyer is accepting the con the, the the house in as is condition, and then we have another amendment that increases um, the closing cost. So there's two that go hand in hand. Cheryl, is there any reason that can't just be an amendment one? versus an amendment to address concerns? I think that if you've got the lender looking for a certain, I mean, contractually you're fine either way, but if you've got the lender looking for everything to be tied up in a little bow, if they're looking for some, if the contract's calling for some amendment to address concerns to exist and you don't have one, legitimately don't have one that's part of your agreement, it. Loan underwriting is like peeling an onion. If you keep going, eventually you're going to hit something that stinks. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to get that underwriter peeling. You don't want to give them a lot of things to pick through. Once they start to get a bad feeling about a loan, you are dead in the water. So I would say tie the whole thing up in the prettiest little bow yeah. possible. And dear goodness, do not attach the inspection report to anything ever. <laughs> while you're while we bringing it up, just it doesn't exist. Does anybody else have anything on that topic? OK, your question? No, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I wanted to know if any of them wanted to continue. But your question. I don't think it's can a you good practice. The so everybody can hear. Oh, she's asking in a multiple that sometimes in a listing in the in the private remarks it'll say you you put the listing in the market on Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon Friday and says um, in it in the private remarks it reads um, no offers will be considered until Tuesday August twenty second or all offers will be considered and responded to on Tuesday August twenty second. It, it, she's asking, is that a good practice? I personally don't, would not do that. I think it goes back to what I mentioned Cheryl said up front. It's kind of like, don't tell your people you're going to get multiple offers, and then you're sitting there with nothing. I think you, you lose all the buyers who have already gotten beat out so many times that they're not going to emotionally attach themselves to another multiple offer situation. And if you do that to enough buyers, then you don't have any buyers at right. all. They might not go. Um, agree. I don't think it's a good practice. I think that if you're really representing the seller, the very first day, you get you may get the best offer you will ever get. And if you if you put that off or you, you tell you know we're not going to accept anything until next week, that buyer may be right there in front of you. And the last thing I want to do is is not represent my seller with their best interests. So I think you really have to sort of take a step back and and make sure that. Whatever you're thinking about doing, whatever little tactic or idea that you have, um, does it really represent the 
client's best interest. And with sellers, you, I don't think that's it. I agree, but I found that things that happen in other parts of the country, particularly California, which is where they do that a lot, eventually make their way to our market, like the escalation clause and a lot of these other things. So don't be surprised in a few years from now we start seeing that all the time. I, I wouldn't do that either, but I do have one bias. I like the first offer that comes in. I don't know. I respect the Ditto. first offer. They, I mean, in my mind, when I'm working with a buyer, I am out there hustling, and I want to get that first offer in. And so if I'm a listing agent and I get an offer right away that's a good offer, I tell my seller, let's see if we can work with this offer. Now, if another one comes in that's better, that's a different story. But I don't want to hold up any good first offers because in my mind, that's probably going to be the one to work with. Cool. Yes, sir. I will never say that somebody's not going to argue something. Um, in, 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 in all honesty, what somebody can what somebody can do, and what he asked was whether or not the phone conversations and, and text messages going on between two real estate agents um, may argue that there was some collusion between the two of them. Um, having spent the last couple of days listening to Freakonomics in the car, and boy, he takes a hard knock on real estate agents. Um, I, I will say that, that you all, just like me, are considered the experts in these transactions. And I don't know if you've read the news lately, but um, there's a lot of things that are going to happen to all of us in the next year or so. And a lot of it is about making sure that consumers are protected. So just like you bulletproof your transaction for all of the parties, I think you need to bulletproof yourself uh, from an accusation that you didn't do something to protect the member of the public, the customer, the client. I'm not saying that you have to have a bad relationship with your customer. I'm just saying that please remember that if anything goes sideways in a transaction, it's going to be your fault, my fault, it's going to be the lender's fault, it's going to be the broker's fault, it's never ever going to be the buyer or the seller's fault. And that's with, that's with the feds, that's with the state, that's probably with the Georgia Real Estate Commission. Just be very, very careful. I haven't heard of anybody saying that the two agents colluded technically when you've got people representing their sides, you know, your your motivation is to protect your client, um, but protect yourself too. I also think that we spend too much time talking to other agents about transactions. I think we should just counsel our clients and do the best job for them, and then just present the offer back. And that way, there's none of because there there are there are some agents that want to put the deal together amongst the agents, and that always strikes me as odd because we're supposed to be representing the client. And how could I know what they would or would not do? So my job is to talk to the clients and spend all my time really t talking to my clients and then putting their best foot forward in writing. Cool. So let's do this. Let's, we're going to wrap it up just because where we are time-wise. You guys, this is amazing. We could probably have four more of these panels, um, and we will. So keep an eye on your email. We will absolutely make this happen. If you guys have specific questions, I think these guys can hang out for just a little bit. But uh, you guys are awesome. I wish we could do questions for another hour. Thank you, guys. <laughs>